you know, remember when I grew up and church was this way or that way. Well, of course, this pandemic is creating all kinds of remember when stories. Like, remember when we didn't have church in person for 13 weeks uh, because we were in that pandemic. And tonight specifically, we'll be able to remember when we sat in our cars in the parking lot on a 90 degree night and baked, but we worship the Lord together. And I am thankful that we can be here tonight. Thank you you all for being here tonight. Uh, One week from tonight, we're actually going to move around to the side of the building to where we have some grass, and we encourage you to bring lawn chairs, blankets if you'd like. If you want to do cars, you can still pull up to the edge. Uh, But the reason we're relocating one week from tonight is because uh, we're going to have some ice cream, and so it's going to be a little bit of a celebration. That will be the last time um, that we'll be outside or not in the building in person because in the following week, on the 21st, we'll return to in-person worship. Well, Luke chapter 10 tonight, we continue to look at the parables of Jesus. And tonight, here in this parable that we call the parable of the Good Samaritan, we want to learn a lesson about neighborly love. Now, of course, this story of the Good Samaritan is one of the most recognized if not the most recognized of Jesus' parables. And while lots of people, though, assume that they understand the meaning of this parable, what I have found is that actually most don't. Because the lesson of this parable is not entirely or not just about helping those in need or showing kindness to strangers. Um, The overarching reason that Jesus gave this parable was actually to provide a story to illustrate how far we fall short of what God's law actually demands of us. And so he's explaining in this parable why good works and why religious merit are never sufficient for us to gain favor with God. And he's showing what the law really demands of us. And in doing that, he's deflating the hopes of religious people who think they can earn salvation. And so the context surrounding or filtering in through into this parable tonight is key for us because here in Luke 10, Jesus is telling this parable to a pompous religious legalist who was trying to diminish the force of God's law by taking a really detailed look or analysis of one word in this parable or one word rather of Jesus is teaching the word neighbor. And so as we consider this parable tonight, I first of all want us to consider the trick question that is posed to Jesus. So here in Luke chapter 10, the context is that Jesus has sent out 70 of his disciples on a final mission to take the gospel to the cities of Galilee. And anticipating the opposition that those disciples would receive, take a look at what Jesus says in Luke chapter 10 verse 10. He says, when you enter any town and they don't welcome you, go out into its streets and say, we are wiping off even the dust of your town that clings to our feet as a witness against you. Know this for certain that the kingdom of God has come near. And I tell you, on that day, it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. So Jesus then continues with some of the harshest words that he ever uttered. And those words were directed specifically at three different... Invite came to the place where the wounded man lay. He did the exact same thing that the priest had done. In essence, it was sort of leadership by example. He's just following his superior, doing perhaps exactly what he did. And so this Levite shows that he too was devoid of compassion and loving kindness. Now these two characters... And this parable represented their culture's best educated and most highly esteemed religious leaders. But they didn't know God and they didn't love God. Because if you know God, you love him by keeping his commands. And they didn't do that. Nor did they love their neighbors. Because when they faced the opportunity to love their neighbor, to love a stranger, they didn't do it. And so they're striking examples of religious hypocrites who appear righteous on the outside but really lack any real virtue. But isn't it true that their attitude is precisely what we see 
most of the time in our own human nature today, even within our own hearts, that we too, we're guilty of blind indifference and insensitivity and careless disregard of people who are in dire need. Even if we don't turn our way every time, we all fail in this duty enough to stand guilty before the law with its demands of utter perfection. And keep in mind, that's exactly what Jesus was illustrating through this parable. And so Jesus, after these two men fail the test, so to speak, or fail the task, what, what he ends up doing is turning the lawyer's question on its head. You see, who is my neighbor wasn't the right question at all. Jesus is showing that righteous compassion is not narrow. It's, it's not seeking for definitions of what sufferers are qualified to deserve help and which ones don't deserve help. The duties of the second great commandment, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, are not limited to the kind of person that someone is. Rather, genuine love compels us to be neighborly, even to strangers and even to enemies. And Jesus makes this point unmistakably clear by introducing us to the Good Samaritan. Let's think for a moment about the relationship between Jews and Samaritans. Unlike the religious professionals, the Samaritan is the man who had compassion on this victim who had a need. And now the victim was a Jewish man as implicated by the context of the parable. And in the minds of Jesus' original audience that would have first received this parable, a Samaritan would have been the least likely source of help for a Jewish man in need. See, Jews and Samaritans, of course, they despised each other. Hostility divided those two peoples for centuries. And Jewish people avoided Samaritans both figuratively and literally. You see, Samaritans were descendants of Israel who had intermarried with pagans after the Assyrians had forced most of the population of Israel's northern kingdom into exile around the year 722 BC. Those Samaritans mixed their Judaism then with pagan religion, and so that's why the Jews had so much animosity for the Samaritans. So here in the parable is a Samaritan man, an enemy of the Jewish victim, and any Jew not knowing the story would think that if the two religious leaders just passed by the man, then most likely the action of the Samaritan would be to probably kill and then rob the man. That's, that's how harshly Jews thought of Samaritans. But look at what verse 33 says about the Samaritan. When he saw the man, he had compassion. So let's think about how the Samaritan loved this victim, this man in need. Something in the Samaritan's heart went out to this man. A sense of sadness, grief, tender-hearted empathy. He saw a man who had an urgent need and he embraced the opportunity to rescue the man and to help him recover. He bore the injured man's burden as if it were his very own. Verse 34 of the parable says that he went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Remember that the victim had been robbed of everything he had. So any resource that the Samaritan used was something that came from his own resource, his own provision. And in describing all that the Samaritan did for the victim, Jesus is stressing the degree of his generosity. It wasn't minimal care. It was extraordinary, boundless sacrifice for someone he didn't even know. He gave the man attention and help and time, as much of it as he needed. Verse 35 says, The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for, the, for whatever extra you spent. Again, this is all remarkable charity, especially considering that the men were strangers. Not only were they strangers, they, they were severe enemies. 
But for the Samaritan, his heart was so full of love that when someone came across his path with a desperate need that he was able to meet, he did everything he could possibly do without question and without hesitation. Unlike the expert in the law, he never stopped and asked the question, who is my neighbor? You see, the, the far more important question is whose neighbor am I? Who can I be a neighbor to? And the answer to that question is anyone, everyone who has a need. Well, let's be honest, if, if we encountered a modern day scenario like this, most of us would probably think that this Samaritan's generosity to a stranger seems a little bit excessive, a little bit over the top, maybe further than we're expected to go. I mean, have you ever done anything like this? Anything like this story illustrates or even thought about doing something like it? Have you ever done something for someone who was your enemy? Have you ever gone to the length of doing everything possible to meet someone's need? And it's very likely that for many of us, there are sporadic examples where we can answer yes to that question. So then the question becomes, well, do we do it consistently? Do we do it all of the time? Every opportunity. So then finally, let's consider the stretch of limitless love. You know, actually, there is someone that we've gone to these links for over and over and over again. You know who it is? Ourselves. I mean, isn't it exactly how we address our needs? There are no links that are too long. There is no difficulty that's too tough to meet our own needs. And sure, we might get closest to self-sacrifice with with family or with close friends, but for ourselves, there, there are rarely any limits. I dare to say that none of us love strangers like this, at least not all of the time. Remember that Jesus actually told the parable of the Good Samaritan in order to show what an impossibly high standard the law sets for us. Really, this, this standard of love is a rebuke to all of us. If we always truly loved our neighbors the way that we love and care for ourselves, the Samaritan's generosity wouldn't seem so remarkable. It would actually seem very ordinary. It would just be part of our nature. But of course, that's not the case. So to finish out the parable, Jesus turns to the expert in the law's question, he turned it right back on him. Verse 36, Jesus says, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The only answer the expert in the law, of course, could give at this moment, I mean, Jesus sets it up on a T for him. So the only answer he could give in verse 37, he says, The one who showed mercy to him. So Jesus said, Go and do the same. The law demands, if we're going to be legalistic Christians who want to work our way to heaven, get there under our own merit, the demand of the law is perfection all of the time. See, Deuteronomy 27 verse 26 says, Cursed is the one who does not confirm all of the words of this law. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, Whoever shall keep the whole law and stumble at even one point, he's guilty of it all. Jesus' final words should have moved this expert in the law to plead for grace and forgiveness. The effect of the law in this parable on that man's life should have shown him how broken and how sinful he were. That's how the impossibility of the law should cause him and really all mankind to respond. In one respect, the law of God guides those who are in Christ to lovingly obey the Lord. But in another respect, in the old covenant respect of the law, what the law of God does is it shows us how sinful and how far short we fall of the glory of God. But an even deeper lesson in this parable is this, that the way that the Good Samaritan cared for the traveler 
is the very way that God loves sinners. And in fact, God's love is infinitely more profound and more amazing and more pronounced than what we see in this parable. The Samaritan sacrificed his time and his money to care for a wounded enemy. And similarly, God gave his own eternal son to die for sinners who deserve nothing more than eternal death. So this parable should point us all to full recognition of the fact that, of course, nobody can earn their way to God. Nobody can earn their own salvation. And that God's love truly is amazing love. Now, did the expert in the law ever embrace this? It's hard to know, but there's nothing in Scripture that would indicate that he did, so apparently not. And so many throughout history have missed it too. So it's fine for us to be motivated by this parable to perfect our love for our neighbors, to be challenged to love others in the way that this Samaritan loved this man in need. But the parable is actually meant to lead us to confess our sinfulness and to seek grace and mercy by turning with a repentant faith to Jesus Christ, who is the only one who truly and perfectly fulfilled what the law demands of us. So just a closing thought. I mean, do, do people really try to earn their way to heaven? Do people really try to merit God's favor, work their way into salvation? The answer to that question is all of the time since time began. So as we unconditionally love people, which is a secondary implication in this parable, let's make sure that we're conveying a gospel of salvation that comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And perhaps tonight would be the perfect opportunity to also make certain of our own faith. That it's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone and not a works-based faith. Father, we thank you for um, just this study in the parables where you have used stories and illustrations to um, teach us deep spiritual truths. And Father, perhaps we've seen the parable of the Good Samaritan in a slightly different glimpse tonight. Um, part of it not new, part of it perhaps new and that Yes, Lord, you model how we ought to love our neighbor, but, but in the context of why you originally gave this parable, it shows us um, that salvation comes by grace through faith alone. That's at least the direction it points us to. And we thank you for that, Father. I thank you that I or any other person here tonight, that we're not left on our own to merit our way to heaven or to earn your favor because that, that would be utter failure in every attempt that we make. But your grace and your mercy and love covers us as sinners. Thank you for that, Father. May the gospel that we preach always be the pure, true gospel, one of grace and faith um, in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And Lord, even for those of us who are in Christ, may our, our faith walks with you always be in response to what you've done, not in effort to better our salvation or keep our salvation make you more favorable to, toward us. Let our loving obedience always be simply an act of sacrifice and a thank offering because your grace, mercy, and love is so great. So Father, thank you for opening the scriptures to us tonight. Thank you for even on this hot night that we're able to gather outside, Lord, to sing your praises and study your word. As we leave this place and go about the week before us, certainly go with us and guide us in all truth that we can glorify you and enjoy you in all things pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Certainly do thank you for coming out tonight. I'll just mention again, we will be outside one last time one week from tonight, but we'll be around the building here in the grassy area. Again, you can sit in your cars if you'd like, but you're also welcome to bring lawn chairs, blankets. We'll spread out on the grass and, and just kind of have a, a worship service, but also a fellowship time over some uh, good summertime ice cream. So um, hope you all have a blessed week. Uh, with that said, we are finished for tonight. Um, so go about doing good and may the Lord be with you.